And uh, now it's time for us to welcome our next, uh, our next reader uh, in the second half of the program, Sarah K. Castle, who published Woo! her first essay in Writer Magazine Woo! in 1987. Motorcycle Magazine? Yeah, that's what, yeah. <laughs> See? Holly was awesome, Sarah's badass. <laughs> Almost 20 years later, she got busy writing science fiction. She attended the Clarion Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers Workshop in 2006. And since then, she's published stories, stories in analog science fiction and nature. She's a registered geologist living in Flagstaff, Arizona, and has worked in national forests, oil fields, a landfill, and most recently for the Institute for Tribal Environmental Professionals. She's also the founder of the Starry Heaven Workshop in Flagstaff, which is where many of us first met. Please welcome Sarah K. Castle. <laughs> from a short story I'm working on right now. It is called The Mutant Stag at Horn Creek. <laughs> I remember when I first saw it, those were damn good days. Maybe the best, but I was younger then. They just started closing the Grand Canyon down. They didn't do it all at once, of course. It started with the canyons that had been mined. Horn Creek was one of them. One of the good things about global warming was it made the Southwest wetter than it had been since the Pleistocene. But all that rain meant the Grand Canyon's mines filled with water. The old adits and shafts from the 1800s filled up and stayed full. The water soaked in and leached out what was left of the metals. After a while, the mines overflowed. They became springs, and they spawned little creeks in some side canyons that didn't usually have water. Now, you can't tell a national park hiker not to mess with a stream in the canyon. It still seemed like desert to most people. The humidity just made the sun seem hotter. After a day hiking across the Tonto Plateau, baking like a cookie on a shale oven sheet, a hiker would see a turquoise pool rimmed in brilliant orange in a shady canyon bottom, and you couldn't keep them out of it. I know, I tried. I remember a couple who showed up in special suits, covered them from toes to fingertips, left heads and necks bare. They knew the risks. They just thought they could beat them. Why don't you tie plastic bags over your heads, I said. Less painful if we get to the emergency part before you get in the water. I could tell that fabric wouldn't protect them. It wasn't even waterproof. Wishful thinking and technology put them together and city folk believe they can do anything they want. I've never been able to tolerate that attitude. There is such a thing as common sense. So I'm not saying you should never question it. The guy smiled at me like I was a fool. We want to get wet, he said. That's the point. I stayed around until they asked me to call the rescue copter. That water was acid. Swimmers didn't notice until they started itching. By then, the damage was already done. To drink it meant sulfate or lead poisoning, depending on the mine. And sometimes it was worse than that. There were only five backcountry rangers in those days. I was one of them. Five people to patrol more than a million acres, on foot. Budget cuts hit the park hard. I guess Congress figured it was in the middle of nowhere. We patrolled alone a lot, and I came to prefer it. In a world full of nine billion people, you appreciate every chance you get to be alone in nature with plenty of space and time. So, I was patrolling up Horn Creek with 20 pounds of water on my back. You didn't want to drink anything coming out of the ground in that canyon. While the mine there had started out chasing copper, it ended up in high-grade uranium. They mined it just after World War II, back when atom bombs weren't just in the movies. In those days, there wasn't a place on Earth they wouldn't have mined uranium. I always carried a Pulaski then. A ranger didn't just patrol. We, we did quite a bit of trail maintenance, though it wasn't required of us. Besides, all the older rangers carried them strapped to their packs. 
How if I wasn't going to carry one too? <laughs> I saw the herd a long ways off. I just rounded Dana Butte, coming out of that part of Salt Creek Canyon they call the Inferno. I watched those deer for half an hour as I hiked towards them. They grazed the plateau's flattest part, right near the edge where the cliffs dropped off into the canyon's inner gorge. I counted 40 does at least and was damn impressed. One stag for all those does. That sucker had a huge rack. <laughs> huge. I couldn't exactly see the shape from that far off, but I had a sense the guy had a regular horn thicket up there on his head. I took my pack off and I snuck towards them. I wanted a better look. You've got to move smooth and quiet around deer or you'll scare them off. God only knows why, but I grabbed my Pulaski. I carried it low with both hands at my waist. No, I take that back. God didn't have anything to do with it. It was what, it was what I'd seen so far in that damn rack. I got pretty close before the does smelled me. They started moving quick and orderly down into a little side canyon that led into the inner gorge. Their hooves clattered on the rock as they descended out of sight. The buck stood guard as his herd departed, keeping an eye on me and them both. I stayed low in the sagebrush. I crushed them as I pushed through it. It might have been that sharp sage nip that took them off about me. The closer I got, the weirder that rack struck me. Now I could see it was tangled. The horns didn't just branch out straight from each other. They twisted and bent in every direction. A couple of bits had flattened out, more like what you'd see on a moose. I was just close enough to see that it was strange, but not exactly how strange, when he followed the last doe over the cliff into that drainage. I strained my ears. His hooves clip clopped just a couple times after he dropped out of sight. They were waiting down there, not more than a couple hundred flat feet away, and maybe 10 or 20 feet down in that side canyon. They wanted me to pass, that was all. They wanted, me, they wanted to come back up on the plateau to continue their easy grazing. I'd let them, but I wanted a closer look at that buck first. <laughs> I crept up to the canyon edge, quiet as I could, stepping toes first on the soft dirt between the shrubs and slowly lowering my heels. I wonder now if I held my breath. Maybe I was a little dizzy when I looked over the edge. That would explain a lot. Because when I did look over, I saw that stag all right. He stood not 20 feet away on a narrow sandstone shelf, just below the notch he knew I'd peer over. I didn't see what was in his eyes at first because, good God, I was looking at that rack. No, I take that back. God wouldn't have had anything to do with it. That rack was something from a nightmare of warped bone plates and twisted sharpened spears. I couldn't take my eyes off it until he snorted and kind of barked at me. Then I saw his face. His brown eyes were bugged out. They blazed. His lips peeled back. My legs went weak. I swear to this day I saw fangs in his mouth. Big ones, almost like the tusks on a javelina. Two on top and two sticking up from its lower jaw. I screamed loud and high in such a way I'm embarrassed to admit to it. That buck took it as a threat. Any creature would have. He reared back on his haunches, and even in my advanced state of inexperience, I could see he was going to spring at me. <laughs> it wasn't hard to imagine that wicked rat smashing into my face because that's what it was about to do. Without thinking, I threw the Pulaski like a boomerang. I remember that damn tool, all hardwood handles, steel axe and adze, spinning through the air. It hit with a clunk and a splinter. The stag's head whipped to the side, its body twisted after it. And that was all I saw, because then I turned and ran. First, I went and got my pack. Then I ran all the way out of the canyon. <laughs> 12 miles on a rough trail, climbing 2,500 feet, I ran the whole way. I never forgot that day. 30 years later, I still think about it probably once a month. Sometimes more often, if something reminds me. 
They closed Horn Creek to everybody shortly thereafter. A big flood tore it up the following year. Radioactive mud got sloshed all over. Before the flood, a couple other rangers saw the stag, but nobody got as close as I did that day. They used to tease me about the teeth, so I quit talking about it. <laughs> but I always wondered what happened to that stag. I never believed I'd killed it. It had twisted to catch itself, that's all. I'd scared it a little, maybe. Certainly I'd marked it off balance. I always wanted to go back to look for that stag. It vexed me that nature would create something so distorted. I guess that's the word I'm looking for. It didn't make sense. I felt then as I feel now, nature makes sense. A person can't always figure it, but you can learn something if you try. I know radiation damages things, but that stag was not sick. It was as strong and full of fight as any critter I'd ever seen. God only knows what would change a creature that way. I take that back. I just didn't know. I couldn't figure it. It bugged me. The canyon had created it. I wanted to know why. Two years ago, they lifted the Horn Creek travel restrictions for rangers. They'd flown a couple drones down there to check for radiation. It had taken 30 years, but all that mud had finally washed away. I talked to Steve Halatuema, the park superintendent, about me going in. I want to check on the deer population down there, I told him. I studied it a bit when I first started here. Now, Steve had been around long enough to know that wasn't strictly true. I mean, we made counts of the critters we saw on our patrols. We even entered the numbers in a computer. But interest in wildlife resources was dying down. You can go down there, Sue, Steve said, but not by yourself. And I don't have anybody to spare to send with you. He'd heard about the mutant stag. It would be good to see who's down there, how he's doing, how they're doing. Steve never called any creature a wildlife resource. He was of the Hopi deer clan and flu clan too. He nodded. I tell you what, you can go down Horn Creek for your final patrol. He looked me hard in the eye. My stomach turned sour. You know it's time, he said. They need help at the outreach center. They fix your hip. Now, the outreach center is where they send old rangers to ease them out of the service. <laughs> they keep us working as long as they can to get some labor out of that pension money. And it's up in that goddamn city where people need to talk to folks who can't come to the parks themselves. People to tell stories and show pictures. Technology and wishful thinking. I'd have spat on the ground.